What makes a city beautiful? Is it green spaces and clean air? Nice buildings, safety, a blooming local economy allowing jobs and a high standard of living, uncongested traffic and a good transport infrastructure? The answer is simple. It's all of these things, and many more. Elements of the puzzle that make up a living city. It's urban fabric. Europe is one of the most urbanized continents, with 75% of the population living in urban areas. Cities are therefore paramount in reaching the EU's ambitious objectives of reaching smart, sustainable and inclusive growth. However, they are also carrying the costs of economic productivity. This fifth summit of regions and cities, hosted by the beautiful city of Copenhagen, is dedicated to the urban dimension of the European Union. Therefore, the Committee of the Region is happy to welcome you to this workshop on urban dynamics and European governance. The first part of the workshop will focus on the impact of the European Union on urban development. Because even though we are one union aiming for the same sustainable future, a coherent urban policy is yet to be integrated. A panel of high-level representatives and experts will address the question to what extent do European cities benefit from their EU membership and how can they make their way in a multi-level governance system? The second part of the workshop will focus on how the public can be involved in regional and local projects. How can cities reach out to their citizens and make them contribute to the local and regional aspects of Europe 2020? We leave you in the hands of your eloquent hosts and hope that by the end of the afternoon these workshops will have given you some new inspiration on how cities and regions can make their citizens feel committed to the urban projects they live in, now and in the future. There we are. So that was uh, an introduction to our debate. Welcome to all our speakers. Uh, just one rule. I would like it to uh, be a debate if possible. So if we can be as short in our introductory comments, uh, I think we have seven minutes uh, for each person. But I would like to try and get some reaction from the audience. And we have to finish at uh, 10.2 so that we can do the switch. We're simultaneous with the other debate. So in, in order to introduce uh, debate about the impact of the European Union uh, uh, in urban development. We're delighted to have with us uh, Claude uh, Jacquier from the National Centre for Scientific Research, uh, Grenoble in uh, France. Uh, J'imagine, uh, Monsieur Jacquier, que vous allez vous expliquer. I can imagine, Mr. Jacquier, that you'll be speaking in the language of Grenoble in French, or are you going to speak in English? Uh, in French, okay. Are you going to do it here or at the podium? Oh, you can do it here. That's perhaps uh, better, but into a microphone, please. So he will be speaking French. Bonjour. Good afternoon. I just have a few comments to make on the basis of the work that was carried out by the Committee of the Regions on the European Union and on the urban dimension. The first comment is of a general nature. The documents that we have and the data that we have at our disposal at the moment uh, to discuss the question of towns and regions are a little out of date and do not, for example, demonstrate the huge financial crisis that we've seen in recent times. As a result, uh, the statistics that I give you may have to be taken with uh, that in mind. The first thing I'd like to say is that Europe has a, a major trump card, which is that among all of the continents of the world, it is the one with perhaps the best distribution of cities across the continent, with a, almost a perfect hierarchy of levels in terms of where the towns are present. That's a very important feature. It's important if you want to have balanced and sustainable growth. One of the difficulties that we experience, based on the data that we see, is that villages and towns across Europe are growing at different rates. Some are continuing to grow, others are experiencing economic and demographic shortfalls. As a result, the load that towns take on in terms of absorbing labour forces and migrant workers is going to be essential when we try to promote 
our development into the future. And as Mr. Barroso was saying, uh, we have to avoid this tendency to revert to our primordial nationalist tendencies. The second point that I want to mention is that we really need to change the representation of our towns. We're currently living in a situation where there is a dichotomy between the town and the rural area. It's a, an all or nothing approach and we need to leave behind that way of envisaging towns and rural areas. We should really think about rural stroke urban regions, areas of transition which can really promote and help us with this development issue. The third comment that I wanted to make this afternoon, and this is in the fifth cohesion report, and it's something that needs to be stressed because it's been brought up in five different cohesion reports. It says, unlike what used to be the case, uh, towns and cities are no longer the prosperous places they once were, they also have areas of very low prosperity. To give you an example, in terms of GDP, uh, Brussels has some two times the GDP on average to the whole of Brussels, uh, Belgium on, on, uh, as a whole, excuse me. Uh, so what that means is that the towns and cities uh, in Europe are concentrating the poorer classes of society. Uh, that's a huge problem. For a long time, uh, we thought that cities should not be eligible for structural funds because they concentrated prosperity. But this is something that the fifth cohesion report underlines very, very well, uh, that that is no longer the case. And I think we need to remember that. The fourth topic I'd like to address is when we address sustainable development, I feel that we have too much of a, a technological approach to it. We have too much of an engineer's perspective on sustainable development. I think these eco-boroughs, where you could develop eco-approaches to energy and positive approaches to that, well these are great, these can be great laboratories for sustainable development, but they don't uh, yet uh, represent a significant portion of our territory. It's less than 0.1%, in fact. For 2020, we have the 320s uh, objective, 20% less, uh, less CO2 emissions, 20% increase in energy efficiency, and 20% renewable energy. And that's only eight years away. That's no time at all. So how are we going to achieve a situation where our European heritage, our buildings, our accommodation is all meeting the standards set out under that target. I am afraid that the failure of the Lisbon strategy is going to be manifest through this 2020 strategy and that is a, a disastrous, disastrous. What can we do about this? Well, that brings me to the fifth comment. It's the role of the towns and cities to make this investment. 70% of long-term investment in cities and towns, whether it's private or public, 70% of our capital that's invested comes through the towns and cities. Can we manage to achieve that same level in the future. If we're going to achieve these targets, we'll need to invest. And in the light of the state debt crisis, the national levels will not be in a position to invest as much. Another point that I'd like to bring to your attention is the fact that the role of towns and city has to be one of innovation. They have to be breeding grounds for innovation. It's not the state level that is going to create this kind of innovation and added value. It's towns and cities that will. We need to use as our guiding principle something that's been forgotten too long. Often you have to go back to the basic principles that structure society, which is this imperative to cooperate. 
If you look at the history of Europe and the nation state, you'll see that success has been achieved through good cooperation. Good cooperation between local authorities. These cooperation mechanisms have been, over the last of a hundred years, what has created our major infrastructures and allowed us to achieve sustainable development. The second type of cooperation that I'd like to address is multi-level cooperation. And here, towns and cities have a huge role to play. If, if you look at the European architecture at the moment, you'll see that there are lots of cross-border regions, metropolises, and it's because of the towns and cities that have struggled for better coordination for strategic reasons. And I'll, f I'll conclude on a seventh comment, and this is in a field that I know very well from my career as a researcher, but also having worked for some 30 years in town development, uh, particularly in some of the most underprivileged boroughs of the European Union. I think that at the European Union level, we have not put enough attention into trying to overcome the imbalances. We need to have the right researchers, technicians, and politicians to, to be able to implement strategies to address this imbalance. We need networks such as Urbac, which the European Union has recently announced, the Ruhr Pact, the Urbac rather network. This is part of a large research infrastructure that can pr promote coordination in the field of research. Just a brief conclusion then. If this question of sustainable development is going to be solved. It's not just a sectoral approach we need. It's not just putting a few million euros or even billion euros here or there. We need a strategy of collective, collective security for Europe against all of these problems such as demographic changes, immigration changes. Uh, what we've seen with the World Water Forum has shown that water is also a key point for towns and cities. Thanks for having uh, opened the debate. I'm afraid I'm going to be very strict on you all. We're going to try and keep you... As you went over seven minutes, we're going to cut you all down to five minutes. I'm going to apply the rules. So I'm going to do my best so that uh, Jan Olbrich gets a chance to provide some conclusions. Anyway, we'll now move on to the Mayor of Lisbon. It's a pleasure to have him here because I think that you provide an example of the positive role that the European Union can play in urban development in your own town. So you have seven minutes. Good afternoon. I'd like to begin by congratulating the European Commission for the new role it's given to cities in implementing the European 2020 strategy. Now, since uh, the very beginning days of our civilization to Greece and Rome, it was cities that constructed Europe. The uh, moderator says, could you please speak into the uh, microphone a bit more so that the interpreters can hear. Now, cities concentrate 80% of Europe's population, but they also are centers for production and growth, they're absolutely essential from a creative point of view and for ensuring you have development that's based on innovation. Cities are also the centre for production of greenhouse gases. They're also uh, centres for the consumption of energy. But it's also in cities, as we've just heard, that you also see the biggest social divides the highest levels of unemployment, you see uh, difficult demographic uh, profiles. It's in the cities that we're going to win or lose the major challenges that we uh, face in trying to have uh, sustainable, smart and inclusive growth. That's the objective we've set under the Europe 2020 uh, program. So I think we need to be clear about the fact we need an integrated strategy so that we can imply the Europe 2020 strategy in cities. Cities are complex systems 
and it's important that every symbol, single element should be dealt with appropriately. We can't deal with them individually, we need to t take an, a holistic approach. All aspects of development are interconnected. We need to ensure that we have an economy which is more competitive. At the same time, we need a more sustainable economy. We need to ensure that we have uh, cities that are better qualified, but also cities which are more inclusive. We need to ensure that we are e efficient in using resources, and that means that we need to have the maximum impact from resources. We need to uh, work towards a world where one plus one can uh, start to be three in future rather than just two. We're trying to work to a more integrated approach. If you think about the major square in the center of Lisbon, we're currently building a, a wastewater collection uh, system so that we can reduce the, the pollution flowing out into the, the river Tagus. Now, of course, to do that, we've had to uncover the whole of the central square. We've had to uh, build the uh, collection tank. We've also dealt with the, uh, the heritage sites on the square. We've uh, changed the traffic system on the square, which thus trying to reduce greenhouse gases. And we've also tried to return this space to the city by uh, getting rid of the, uh, the traffic and uh, making terraces and uh, walking areas for citizens. Now, we also had pro problematic areas where there was prostitution and drug dealing. And we've been working on urban regeneration. We've had a major project to try and improve the quality of the public space. It improves self-esteem. It stimulates private owners of buildings to uh, invest in their own property. We've also tried to ensure that the city is attractive uh, in tourist, tourism terms. We've tried to create local jobs to support uh, the uh, elderly population in particular. We've created urban gardens. We've uh, tried to uh, improve the quality of uh, the soils through this system, and that uh, helps to reduce the flooding risk. We've also tried to include uh, measures for inclusion. So we've even used... Uh, uh, workers which don't have qualifications, but we've uh, allowed them to help produce food in these urban gardens, and thus we've provided support for some of the poorer citizens of our cities. So I think this is the uh, advantage of integrated uh, projects which can combine environmental aspects, economic aspects, and social inclusion aspects. Thank you. Uh, Mayor of Livorno, a member of the Committee uh, of the Regions, uh, perhaps you ha also have uh, some interesting points, I think, to tell us uh, about the way that the, uh, the European uh, Union has helped uh, development or has uh, been beneficial uh, in your town. Nella vostra città, in italiano. Intanto credo. Thank you very much. I'm talking about a process that's already given a lot of positive results. If we just look at the problems that subsist. And see how cities have done since the setting up of the European Union, we can see there are certain things which have definitely helped as we've re-examined the way urban space is used, the way infrastructure has been renewed, and in particular, the anticipation of problems, socio-economic po population problems, and in particular, an attempt to rise to a challenge, a challenge of having a city that's both modern and one that provides decent quality of life. I remember meetings, people from Rotterdam, Bristol, and when we had the informal part of the meeting, we set together to exchange ideas and 
mobilise resources and use them. I'm thinking of the urban sustainable development integrated plans in Tuscany. We've got 17 local authorities involved and we've had over 300 separate actions and we've decided and were able to set up a system examining some of the issues that the Mayor of Lisbon has just talked about, restructuring parts of our cities that have been allowed to decay, trying to put together an urban identity that's inclusive and simultaneously something that doesn't close off the city from what happen, what's happening around it. So these are positive things. And we should look back and remember that the past is also the vector for the future. There is another problem, of course, which is how policy impacts on all of this. One problem, uh, the real problem that's mainstream through this is how economic operators impact on all of this. Because of the crisis which is still hitting us hard in Europe, the public authorities are seeing their position weakened. So what we need to do is find a way of unlocking the potential that local authorities have in achieving genuine governance over their urban areas and renewing the, uh, the public system at all levels of government and rethinking governance in our cities. We need to try to integrate urban planning and decision-making processes and we need to look at more flexible forms of government. So if we don't find them, we'll just end up talking about the past and the good we achieve there. Machiavelli was mentioned, of course, he's an Italian author and in chapter 18 of The Prince, Machiavelli says that reformers are people that no one wants at all. On the one hand, when people are all right, they say, well, I'm fine, why should I do any reforms? And if someone is not doing so well, they need an instant response. They feel that they need an instant response, and reformers are very, usually, very often unable to provide that. So what we need to do is start to think about a way we could bring in new tools and also look at urban areas as a possible area where responses to the crisis can be found. There, I don't want to mention what's just been happening in France because that's a topic for a different discussion, but I think our nations need to look at the fact that young people often don't feel citizenship. They don't feel that they're members of society. As to what these new instruments might be, I'm not quite sure, but that is the problem. We've started and we've got off on the right foot, I think, but we need to make sure that everyone feels able to contribute. Otherwise, in the future, we're not going to have citizens who will want to take part in this discussion. So now uh, go to uh, Sie werden Deutsch sprechen. Uh, let's German Burkhard uh, Jung, Sie sind uh, der Bürgermeister von Leipzig. Ich freue mich. Uh Your, Mr. Jung is the mayor of Leipzig. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you. We were at a meeting in Leipzig recently together. I'd very much like to know what the vision is that the European Union should have of our towns and cities and how can that be implemented in concrete terms. Perhaps you could give us a few examples from the city of Leipzig. Certainly, says the speaker. Well, first and foremost, I am deeply convinced that trade and promotion of trade